webinar will be the last webinar or last lecture that corresponds to the section on muscle physiology. But this will not be the only time that you ever hear about cardiac muscle or muscle physiology. Cardiac muscle, when we discuss it, always keep in mind of the differences between skeletal and cardiac muscle. How are they different? How are they similar? During this lecture, we will be looking at action potentials in cardiac muscle and also cells of a specialized system within the heart that allows uh, the heart to contract. Unlike what in the smooth muscle, we really didn't cover the action potentials there. The reason why in smooth muscle action potentials and electrical activity, we'll discuss that more next trimester. So we will go over some action potentials in regards to cardiac muscle. There will be some similarities to skeletal muscle and then there will be some differences also. So the first thing let's look at is let's look at the anatomy. Cardiac muscle, like skeletal muscle, is striated. So why was skeletal muscle striated? Why was smooth muscle not? The striations come from the regular arrangement of the actin and myosin filaments. You have those sarcomeres and so you get those striations. The cells are typically branched in cardiac muscle. They're not elongated as you saw in smooth and skeletal muscle. They have uh, single nuclei, but every once in a while you'll see they may have more than one nuclei, two or more, but generally they're, they're centrally located single nuclei. The um, presence of intercalated discs. Here, I'm going to go ahead here so you can see the intercalated disc using light microscopy and I'll go back here to this picture. The intercalated disc, discs comp are comprised of gap junctions and desmosomes. The desmosomes help to kind of keep everything connected, kind of like an anchoring type filament. The gap junctions are channels. They are pretty much like ion channels. They allow the electrical connection between the cells so the cardiac muscle can act as a functional syncytium, as, as if the, the, the cells were all fused together. When you want the heart to contract, you want the atria, the left and right atria, to contract together as a unit to fill up, finish filling up the ventricles with blood. Then you want the ventricles to act as a unit to generate enough force, enough pressure to get the blood out through the great vessels and either to your lungs or to the heart. So you want this, this really good connection in the sarcomeres, not sarcomeres, sorry, the intercalated discs allow this to happen. The cardiac muscle does have T-tubules just like skeletal muscle. What was the function of the T-tubules again? They are, what are they? They are invaginations of the sarcolemma that go deep down into the muscle, allows the action potentials to go deep into the muscle and trigger the release of calcium, which is needed for muscle contraction, just like you saw in skeletal muscle. Differences, though. The T-tubules in the uh, smooth muscle are... Um, a little bit short, shorter, they're broader, and you don't have typical triads. So over here in skeletal muscle, what was the triad? You have a T-tubule and the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum on either side. Here's a triad. Those T-tubules kind of were uh, corresponded to the zones of overlap that you saw in skeletal muscle. You do not have triads in cardiac muscle. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is kind of... Um, odd, I mean odd, they are um, not as well developed as in skeletal muscle, just like you saw in smooth muscle. They do store calcium, but they're just not as well developed. The T-tubules are very short, they are more broad, they tend to circle and circle the um, sarcomeres at the Z-lines or the z disc. that's where you find them. The since the sarcoplasmic reticulum is not as well developed as in the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle is very much more dependent upon the extracellular fluid levels of calcium, just like you saw in smooth muscle. So there's a 
how its cardiac muscle is similar to smooth muscle in that it has poorly developed sarcoplasmic reticulum, so it's more dependent upon extracellular fluid levels of calcium. It's different from skeletal muscle in that it's not. Then that skeletal muscle is, is much more, or the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very well developed and it only depends on the calcium stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The functionally, the cardiac muscle is, com, can be completely independent from the nervous system. The heart will contract without nervous input, unlike skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, in order for it to contract, you must need nervous input. The skeletal muscle needs nervous input from the somatic nervous system. Cardiac muscle has intrinsic pacemakers. It has these autoarrhythmic cells that can spontaneously depolarize and generate the electrical impulse. Under normal conditions where this all begins and sets the whole, um, what's the word I want, the whole ball rolling, get the ball rolling, is specialized cells within the sinoatrial node or SA node, which, which, which is up in the right atria. These spontaneously depolarize. The electrical impulse will be transmitted to the cells, and you see here into the contractile cells, the muscle cells, and again through the muscle cells, it can travel cell to cell through these gap junctions. So the cardiac muscle can are able to contract without the nervous system telling it what to do, but it the autonomic nervous system still can control cardiac muscle. So the cells of the SA node sets a basic rhythm and rate of which the heart will beat. The, the autonomic nervous system can modify it. So it will be responsive to stimulation from the autonomic nervous system and it can ch change heart rate and contractility. And just like I had mentioned with smooth muscle, the innervation from the nervous system in, as in smooth muscle can be excitatory or inhibitory. Skeletal muscle, remember nervous system input is always excitatory. So there's a little difference between skeletal muscle too. The, we are going to be looking at the differences between the action potentials that you see in the cells, say such as in the SA node, and the cells within the muscle. So there's going to be some differences there and we're going to look at that later. The, I had mentioned that the heart has its own intrinsic system and we're going to call it the cardiac conduction system and we're going to be looking at that more in depth at a later lecture. So the impulse originates normally up in the SA node which is located up in the right atria and then it's transmitted down through the heart through specialized cells of the cardiac conduction system. But as mentioned earlier, the autonomic nervous system does innervate the heart and can alter the rate and contractility. The skeletal, when you look at cardiac muscle action potentials and compare it to the skeletal muscle, just look at the differences in the, in the, the picture here. The action potential in cardiac muscle is longer. And which also is a reason why the contraction of cardiac muscle lasts longer. Cardiac muscle's whole entire job in life is to contract, create enough pressure, enough, uh, or build tension to build pressure to get blood moving. And so I want to be able to contract a little bit longer than you see with skeletal muscle. Big difference, another big difference between skeletal and cardiac muscle is the lengths of the refractory periods. If you just look at the blue color, the blue represents the absolute refractory period in the corresponding muscle. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize the, act, the absolute refractory period in skeletal muscle is much shorter than in cardiac muscle. What results is with cardiac muscle Cardiac muscle, you will not be able to get sustained tetanic contractions. The properties of cardiac muscle, this, the plasma membrane are different from skeletal muscle.
you cannot have individual twitches undergo wave summation as you would with skeletal muscle and you cannot get tetanic contractions. Why is that so significant? Well, cardiac muscle, you don't want to have tetanic contractions because they will not be able to pump blood. The heart has to periodically contract, relax, contract, relax. When it's relaxing, it's filling up with blood. It contracts, it gets the blood out. So it's important that you don't have tetany in cardiac muscle. The excitation contraction coupling in cardiac muscle is similar as in skeletal muscle with one notable exception. So this is a good, um, another good opportunity to review what takes place in muscle contraction when you get the stimulus coming and what ultimate results in contraction of that skeletal muscle. So just like skeletal, or cardiac muscle in this case, cardiac muscle you have an action potential. That action potential could have come from a, a cell from the cardiac conduction system. It could have come from the autonomic nervous system innervation. It could have come from an um, adjacent muscle cell. So somehow we have an action potential arriving at that particular cell. Just like skeletal muscle, it will be moved down or it will be sent down to the T-tubule which again you see is an invagination of the sarco sarcolemma. It moves down in, in here in cardiac muscle the DHP receptor or the dihydropyridine receptor in cardiac muscle is activated by calcium unlike skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle the DHP receptor which we're illustrating right here at number two on the slide in skeletal muscle, it was activated by a change in voltage. In cardiac muscle, it's calcium. In what with cardiac muscle, I just want you to, re to realize this will apply with skeletal muscle too. This, this T tubal right in here, this is extracellular fluid. This has calcium in it. And remember, cardiac muscle is very much more sensitive to calcium in the extracellular fluid than in skeletal muscle. So what happens here is the DHP receptor is going to be activated or triggered to open because of calcium or calcium, the presence of extra calcium here. So what happens is this is activated by calcium. Calcium will enter the cell. This will trigger even more calcium to be released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so which in, in here, this is the rionidine receptor, just as you saw in skeletal muscle. The rionidine receptor is really just a calcium channel. So those are the same in skeletal and cardiac. The only difference is in skeletal muscle, the DHP receptor is activated by voltage, change in voltage. Here it's by changes in calcium. So what happens here is the rionidine receptor opens, releases more calcium. This increase in calcium is going to ultimately result in contraction of the skeletal muscle. So how does it do it? You're not really seeing it here, but let's review it. Calcium binds to troponin. This is exactly what you saw in skeletal muscle. So troponin C binds calcium. You get a conformational change. The tropomyosin moves out of the way, which normally would have been blocking a, bi a binding site for actin and myosin, so it just moves out of the way. So now myosin can interact with act actin, forming a cross bridge, and eventually you're going to get your cycling. As long as calcium is present, you have enough ATP, you're going to generate tension um, as a result of the contraction of the, of the muscle. When calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the calcium ATPase, calcioquestrin is still here, kind of binding up the calcium. You also have calcium being removed from the cell into the extracellular fluid using sodium calcium exchangers. Calcium levels dip down again in here. You cannot have the, the muscle contraction. So when calcium levels are reduced, then 
uh, cardiac muscle contraction cannot continue. So excitation contraction coupling in cardiac muscle is absolutely identical to skeletal muscle with the exception, or I should say a couple exceptions, is you have the DHP receptors different. In cardiac muscle, the DHP receptor is um, triggered by calcium, not by voltage. In that in, in cardiac muscle, the levels of calcium out here is very important for cardiac muscle contraction since there's not enough calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to get enough calcium inside the cell for muscle contraction to occur. So if you want to compare, and you have this in your notes, you want to compare skeletal versus cardiac muscle. The trigger for calcium release is different. Cardiac muscle, it's we call it calcium activated calcium release. In skeletal muscle, it was voltage activated calcium release. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum release of calcium was because the DHP receptor was able to activate the rionidine receptor. And the DHP receptor in skeletal muscle was activated by a change in membrane voltage. The DHP receptor are different between the two. Skeletal muscle, it's voltage sensitive. In cardiac muscle, it's calcium sen sensitive. The amount of calcium release is somewhat different between the two. In skeletal muscle, the amount of calcium released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum is directly proportional to the changes in membrane voltage. The greater change in membrane voltage, the greater calcium release. In cardiac muscle, the amount that calcium that's released is going to be proportional to how much calcium has entered the cell through the or gone into uh, down to the T tubule, which is part of the extracellular fluid. So as more calcium is released, it's going to release even more calcium. So there's a little bit difference there too. One thing just to kind of show you or to emphasize the the role that the extracellular fluid levels of calcium play in cardiac muscle contraction is that if you put a heart into a solution that's calcium free, it will cease to beat. And you can pull a heart, or I mean, if I did, which you know I'm not going to do this, is if I opened up your chest, I cut out, you know, I cut your heart out, stuck it in a bowl of, say, ringer solution, something that's very kind of similar to um, what you have in your body, it will continue to beat because it doesn't need that nervous system input. But if I put your heart in a solution that does not have any calcium in it, it will stop beating because it relies so heavily on the extracellular fluid levels of calcium. Skeletal muscle doesn't care what the extracellular fluid levels of calcium are. It depends on the levels of calcium that are within the, or originate from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the last topic when we look at cardiac muscle is the action potentials. There will be some similarities with the action potentials with cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. There will be some differences. But I also have to look at two types of action potentials that you'll see within the heart. And I have to say within the heart. First thing we're going to look at is the action potentials within cardiac muscle. So this will be the atrial muscle or ventricular muscle. They look slightly different. The one that you see here is from ventricular muscle, but the same things apply. So, I mean, there's going to be some slight differences in how it looks, but overall what's going on is the same. We will also look at the action potentials that you'll see within the specialized cells of the cardiac conduction system. We will review it again at a later date. So this will not be the only time that you get this material. So the first type of action potential that we're going to look at is what you find within the muscle. They call it a fast response type. The other type that we're going to be looking at is called a slow response type. So with the fast type or fast response type, the action potentials are longer than you see with the slow. The refractory periods are going to be a little bit longer. 
what you're going to going to be real obvious when you you compare the pictures is this one has a stable rusting membrane potential just kind of stays here about minus 90 millivolts and here's a difference too is this one you're going to see which is completely unlike what you saw with skeletal muscle the fast response type of action potential you see in cardiac muscle has what we call a plateau phase and we're going to tell you what causes that in a moment so difference with skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle the resting membrane potentials are a little bit different there's always going to be different between nerves um, different types of muscles it so happens in the uh, cardiac muscle it's anywhere from minus 85 to minus 95 millivolts and I just happen to have minus 90 millivolts so here we have a stable resting member membrane potential right here well we had some sort of stimulus nearby say we had a muscle cell that was um, a action potential originated from a nearby cell or cell of the cardiac conduction system there'll be a trigger that is going to cause a movement or it's going to cause the entry of sodium into the cell the what happens is you have as sodium moves into the cell, we call this phase zero, you're going to get depolarization of the cell, just like you saw with skeletal muscle. Why do you get depolarization? And what do you see? You're going from a minus up to a less minus, becoming positive voltage there, because as the positive charges are entering the cell, you get a reversal of charge. It's going to be less negative one thing I need to mention now because otherwise I will forget about it is it so happens that these channels these are what we call voltage regulated fast sodium channels that are opened their trigger to open is a change in membrane voltage so you have a change in voltage it's going to open these channels you're going to have sodium flooding into the cell these channels happen to be blocked by a toxin called tetrodox toxin which happens to be something you can get from puffer fish so you can google puffer fish and you can you know look up see what why if someone eats a puffer fish and it's not properly um, cleaned they're going to die okay so this happens to be blocked by this toxin called puffer fish this will be important when we look at the slow response type because the sodium channels that we see in the slow response type are not blocked by tetrodotoxin and I'm going to mention that a little bit later so here we have sodium entering the cell the cell depolarized you have it goes up you get this little notch right here because you have just slight initial repolarization of the cell at a certain um, voltage the sodium channels become closed the voltage uh, gated sodium channels close the potassium channels open up and you're going to have transient current or outward movement of potassium out and so it's going to start going back down towards the resting membrane potential and they call this phase one but then look at all of a sudden the membrane voltage isn't changing it's not repolarizing like you think it should as you, you saw with the skeletal muscle well what happens here is you have what we call a plateau phase within cardiac muscle what's happening here is sodium is being pumped out of the cell but you don't have a net loss in positive charges because calcium is entering the cell we have this opening of these channels that we call slow calcium channels and calcium is moving in remember we need calcium for contraction anyway so as calcium is moving in sodium is moving out you don't have a net change in positive charges and so the membrane potential remains the same the, these calcium channels remain open for a good period of time anywhere about maybe up to 200 milliseconds and so you have a pretty stable membrane potential and then as they begin, begin to close the calcium channels begin to close the um, potassium 
Potassium is continuing, or sorry, continuing to um, move out. As it moves, the potassium moves out. The membrane potential is going uh, more and more to that resting membrane potential. So you're losing those positive charges, and you're going to get back to your resting membrane potential. And so as potassium leaves, you're going, you're getting repolarization of the cell and then you can wait for another impulse to come along and start it all over again. What you'll notice here, you see the same picture here, I want you to compare the skeletal cardiac muscle. Because of the presence of that plateau phase, you see that cardiac muscle's action potential lasts longer than the skeletal muscle. So in skeletal muscle, it's like, you know, like a, a millisecond. In cardiac muscle, it's like 250 milliseconds, so there's a big difference in how long the action potential lasts. But what you also notice again is the refractory periods, both the absolute, which is in the blue, and the relative refractory periods are longer in cardiac muscle. Let's review of what these refractory periods mean. An absolute refractory period means no matter how strong the stimulus, you cannot generate another impulse. So in skeletal muscle, if once you've got, you know, if you, you stimulate it here, 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 you're not going to get another action potential. But once you pass this, yes, you will. In cardiac muscle, that period of time is much longer. This is, again, the reason why you can't get wave summation in cardiac muscle. You can't, it's going to take, I mean, it's the muscle, is that, or cardiac muscle is already starting, it's starting to relax before you can even start, you know, be able to get another um, action potential generated, before you can, you know, have it contract again. So you can't get the wave summation. You can't get tetany in cardiac muscle. The um, period of contraction, you see, look at the period of contraction in cardiac muscle is longer than in with skeletal muscle. Now, also, with, I had mentioned the in the yellow, that corresponds to the relative refractory period. The relative refractory period is a period of time in which you could generate another action potential, but you need a much greater stimulus to do it. Cardiac muscle, again, still has a longer refractory period, or relative refractory period, than you have with um, skeletal muscle. So look, if you kind of look at this thing, by the time the thing's almost done with a contraction before you can generate another impulse with cardiac muscle here, it's still, I mean, you can stimulate while well, it's still contracted, so this is where you can get, still get some of that wave summation, get more and more tension build up with the skeletal muscle. You can't do it with cardiac muscle. But remember, tetanic contractions of cardiac muscle, you will not be able to pump blood. I don't want that with cardiac muscle. Now, the other type of action potential see within the heart or what you'll see within the cells of the cardiac conduction system. For example, the SA node, the sinoatrial node, they, they, they have these cells we call P cells or pacemaker cells. They exhibit what we call a slow response type of action potential. You'll see this is also in cells from the AV node or atrial, atrial ventricular node. We'll be discussing that when we talk about the cardiac conduction system much more in depth. Now, what is a big difference between the slow response and the fast response is there is no true resting potential. I mean, it says resting potential here, but it's not a true resting potential. They call it a pacemaker potential because it never sits. It's always kind of slowly changing. It never remains constant. The reason, or actually, give you, before I give you the reason, is the cells, these cells, are also or the resting or let's I'm using air quotes air quotes the resting memory potential in the in the pacemaker cells is a lot less negative about minus 60 millivolts versus what you saw what minus 90 in the muscle cells why is that these cells are notoriously leakier to sodium so the cells are leakier to sodium so you have all this movement of sodium in you're going to cancel out some of those that negative charges, so 
it's not quite as negative. Well, who cares about that? What's so significant about that? We'll tell you the significance of that. Here, you'll see as the sodium moves in, because they're leakier, and they, they call it via, you see this, it stands for funny, and the I for current, via a funny current through these funny sodium channels. Well, it so happens as the sodium is moving in, you see that the membrane potential is becoming even less and less negative. Then you hit the threshold, just like in any other um, um, like nerves, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle. You hit a particular threshold, that's going to trigger the action potential. If you don't reach threshold, you will not have an action potential. Well, here, at about minus 40 millivolts, that will just, um, stimulate a action potential. And what happens here, you get this huge depolarization. And with that depolarization, they call it phase zero, just like you saw with ventricular muscle. But the calcium movement is what is responsible for the depolarization in the slow response type cells, not sodium. So in, as we saw in skeletal muscle, it'll apply also to nerve cells, cardiac muscle, you saw that depolarization was due to the movement of sodium, and it was through these voltage-sensitive sodium channels. Well, here's the significance for you. At this membrane potential right here, the voltage-sensitive sodium channels are already inactivated. They're not going to open up. And so these channels, sodium channels, who, who's key to getting them open is voltage, they're already turned off. And so if you want to depolarize the cell, it's not going to do you any good to do anything to the voltage-sensitive sodium channels. What happens is the calcium influx is what's going to result in depolarization of these cells. So you see the calcium moving in here, so that's depolarization. You'll notice there is no phase 1 and no phase 2. There's no little, little notch. There is absolutely no plateau phase with these cells. You do have Phase 3, because of potassium moving out, that results in repolarization. And as it repolarizes, the, it goes back down towards our membrane, the, again, air quotes, resting membrane potential. The uh, subsequ subsequent um, action potential is going to be triggered by um, this repolarization. So as the, this repolarizes the, um, the, these funny channels, and we'll tell you why they're, getting, why they're called funny channels, these guys open up again, or no, they're always kind of open, but they make sure that each action potential in these cells is always followed by another. So what kind of triggers it is the repolarization. As it repolarizes, then it's going to set, set in action this whole series of events again. So it just kind of keeps going. It's just like, just going to keep on going. I'll do my thing, do my thing, do my thing. And what happens with these, these cells in the SA node, they have a spontaneous depolarization rate of anywhere, you know, it's different. Everybody's a little bit different. From 60 to 100 um, beats per minute. It corresponds to what your heart rate would be. It's anywhere from 60 to 100 beats per minute. They set your basic heart rate is how the rate in which these guys spontaneously depolarize. Well, the reason why they call this movement, this sodium influx, that we call phase four, so we call phase four, these funny current or funny channels, is when they were studying this, they're like, oh, let's throw tetrodotoxin in here because we know it with the ventricular muscle cells. Tetrodotoxin blocks sodium influx, so that should um, stop the depolarization, that phase zero. These cells are not blocked by tetrodotoxin. So the thing is, those, these channels are completely different from those channels in the muscle cells. The muscle cells were voltage-activated sodium channels. These are completely different sodium channels, so they're not blocked by the same thing. So you throw tetrodotoxin in there, it doesn't do anything to these cells, but it will mess up the muscle cells. So that's what they, so they said, hmm, 
they're sitting there studying it like this is kind of weird or funny so that's why they said oh let's call them funny channels because they did not respond to trotodoxin is what they thought should have happened but it wasn't these are completely different type of channels now we're going to be looking at these this again when we talk about the cardiac conduction system and I'm going to review this these steps again with you and so it's important right now though to prepare for your exams is know if review the extra potentials that you see in skeletal muscle what's responsible for the depolarization what's responsible for repolarization rough idea of the resting membrane potential and then compare it to cardiac muscle and then also com and then compare it to the action potentials that you see in the pacemaker cells so there's some no very important differences in between the fast response and low response type of action potentials and there's obviously some similarities with um, the ventricular muscle and skeletal muscle so just kind of show you get the similarities here let's go here so skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle the, the depolarization is because of entrance of sodium opening of voltage gated sodium channels the repolarization is because of potassium efflux or the potassium movement out of the cell that's the same but you have remember in cardiac muscle big difference here is you have a plateau phase in cardiac muscle but you do not see that in skeletal muscle you should make sure you know what's responsible for that plateau phase or that phase zero it's calcium movement into the cell the know the difference between this X potential and this one so what phases are absent why is the membrane potential different between ventricular muscle and the pacemaker cells? So remember that the pacemaker cells, the, the, those, the membrane is leakier to sodium, so it's less negative. And, as, and what's responsible for that just slow trying to get up to threshold is just sodium just kind of moseying on in, not because anybody told it what to do, it's just moving in because it's leakier to sodium, it's just moving in, then you hit a certain magic number stimulates that X potential and you get that calcium influx unlike what you see in skeletal muscle in cardiac muscle so kind of always remember what's good thing is draw the pictures out compare them say what's similar what's different that's a good thing to do is just draw the pictures out tell me what's responsible for the changes in membrane potential and then make sure you know the differences between the three types the skeletal muscle the fast response um, action potentials in the heart and the slow response action potentials in the heart.